Okay, let's resume. Okay, back to the session. Okay, so that's our firewalls. The next thing that we have are much more advanced. Uh, these are devices that understand that a threat exists. They know what the threat looks like. And so they work towards that. The first of these is called a threat detection system. A threat detection system is in itself very simple, as in it will detect a threat. And after it has detected the threat, it will give the authorized people alerts saying a threat has happened. That is it. An intrusion has occurred. I am informing you. OK, plain and simple. It doesn't do anything at this stage. So now the person who is controlling the intrusion detection system will take collective action, which could also mean informing authorized personnel, uh, informing organizations, maybe if a very major breach has occurred, informing law enforcement, uh, reporting it to government authorities, things of that kind, depending, again, on what is part of their procedural mechanisms. Now, this intrusion detection system works on multiple inputs. So it will take logs from many, many, many applications. It will take information from the antivirus. It will take information from the firewall. It will put it all together and it will say, based on the info that I have, I infer that an intrusion has occurred. Also, at this stage, it is for the, the person who is controlling the IDS to confirm that the intrusion has actually occurred. So you might, at this stage, suddenly realize that uh, the intrusion is much, much bigger than what you seem to have understood, or that the intrusion was just a series of uh, malfunctions and it's a false alarm. As intrusion detection systems have evolved, the frequency of false alarms have definitely reduced. They are much more alert, much more uh, educated in understanding what a threat actually looks like. In the same sense, we have what is called, uh, let's get back to this, what is called an intrusion prevention system. Now, there is a difference in the two beyond the name itself. The intrusion detection system detects, detects the intrusion, intrusion after, after it has occurred and will issue an alert. The intrusion, the intrusion prevention system, system I don't know. Attempts, 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 attempts at intrusion and will try and prevent them from happening. From happening. So, so the IDS is reactive. IDS proactive. Open. So the IPS is going to try and prevent any attacks from happening. It is going to analyze all the data that comes through. It is it again going to take, take logs from firewalls, uh, antivirus, antivirus software, software uh, computer, uh, computer systems, systems routers, routers, modems. Everything that it can find will all feed into it. And based on the data that it has, it will analyze it and it will try and prevent attacks from happening. Intrusion prevention systems are trained to take collective action and then inform their handlers. Now, 
it sounds like these are alive and kicking things. They are not. They are uh, devices that are programmed. Today, we are working on involving artificial intelligence and machine learning in these devices. So they get much more um, capable and much more informed. Now, these devices are typically set up somewhere in your network. So back to your network. Let's go to a simpler one. OK. That's not at all simple. We'll deal with this one only. OK. This is your network. This is your internet out wide. We'll put the first intrusion detection system here outside the network. We'll then put a firewall. And we'll put our second intrusion detection system after this. So you've got a firewall, you've got your antivirus, and you've got your second IDS. This could possibly be replaced by an IPS, an intrusion prevention system. These are going to take data from all of these feeds, study it, and then try and figure out what on earth is happening. Once they know, they'll take corrective action. Or they will issue alarms saying that there is a problem. Deal with it. Again, the work that it will do is going to be one of many things. So let's say that um, we have a system here which is, we have a system set up in. Uh, India. We have one system set up in India, one system set up in uh, France. Now, both these systems typically will get traffic from India, the Indian subcontinent region, and will get traffic from Europe. Suddenly, we start getting traffic from South America. This traffic has never come before. So we know that we have never received traffic from South America before. Automatically, you start treating this traffic as being suspicious. If it is one or two hits that are coming at your system, you're fine with it. But if suddenly you start getting thousands of hits per minute, you know that the probability that these hits are malicious is very high. So you block off all traffic coming from South America. You might have seen, if you are um, browsing the internet, certain news articles, because this most often, uh, the most common is with, uh, for lay people to see is with news articles. So you're trying to open a news article, and it suddenly tells you this content is not available for your geography, which basically means that for where you are logging in from, this content is not permitted. It They won't show it to you. They are blocking off your IP address. So they are blocking off all IP addresses that may be originate in India. That kind of logic is what is used by an IPS. So it's going to say that I have received, I think these are threatening uh, messages. I'm going to block it. The same way as we block annoying spam calls, that's what is done by an IPS. After the IPS, which again is set up, we have, in some ways, the most interesting of the security devices called the honeypot. Now, the honeypot is meant to be attacked. So the honeypot doesn't do a preventive job. As in the honeypot is not standing like a security guard in front of all your data saying, I'm going to protect it. The honeypot is the decoy. So the honeypot is that crazy person who goes into the middle of the fight saying, hey, attack me, attack me, leave the other people. That is the job of the honeypot. So the honeypot is basically going to make itself an attractive target look real, look exactly like what is what an attacker is going to want, but is designed to attract the attacker so that the other systems of the network
do not get attacked. Now, in that sense, if you make it far too attractive, then it's suspicious. If it seems exactly like one of the other systems with hundreds of layers of security, again, it might not be most convincing. So what you set it up as is a slightly vulnerable system that has been left that way by mistake and contains useful data. Now, the point of the honeypot is one that if you do have people who are going to attack your system, they'll attack the honeypot. So your systems stay safe. The second is when the honeypot is being attacked, the mechanism of the attack is studied. So you know how the attackers are trying to attack your network. You gain knowledge from that and you use that knowledge to make your security better. The third is in some cases, from the attacks carried out on the honeypot, you can track back to who your attackers are. And then you can take action against those. Could be legal action also. So honeypots are not exactly security devices, but they are security devices that will, or rather they are devices that will strengthen your security while not actually performing security functions. It is opening itself up for the attack. And by doing so, it shows you how better to improve your security. So that's the role of the honeypot. Now, all of these things work along with what is called a content filter. Now, a content filter's job is to look at your content and decide what content is acceptable and what is not. Now, a content filter could be very simply a block list versus an allow list, which means that if certain words exist, it will say put those in the block list, and certain other words will be put into the allow list. If the, any content that is coming into your system contains words from the block list, your content filter is going to say, sorry very much, you can't come in. So, you know, these, um, these restaurants exist where some of them require you to be dressed in a particular manner, as in, you'll have some restaurants that are suit and tie, formal shoes, that kind of thing. If you turn up in jeans and a t-shirt and sneakers, they are possibly going to say sorry very much, but you cannot enter. What are they basing it on? You don't have the correct content. That's the same logic of a content filter. So some content filters are not good enough in that you can disguise an attack as containing the correct words, but it is malicious. So it looks right and is dangerous. But the content filter's job is basically to say, that if these words exist, if this content exists, block it. So certain kinds of, um, in a corporate network, all pornographic sites are banned. In a lot of colleges, if you are using their Wi-Fi connectivity, you will not be allowed to access certain websites. Those certain websites could be something as um, basic as Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, those kinds of things, not because of the content there, but because of the bandwidth that these sites require. So are we couldn't access scores because it just took too much bandwidth. It used to keep refreshing after the empty ball. And so too much bandwidth was used and that site was blocked. In the same sense, you will have certain sites that get blocked and certain sites that are kept open. So your content filter will typically always contain an allow list and a block list. 
The lists could be made up of specific keywords or specific websites or specific IP addresses or a combination of all three. And as new content is found that needs to be put into the specific lists, you will put them into the allow or the block list. From security um, perspectives, it is much easier to build an allow list than to build a block list. Simply because if you're going to allow five sites and block everything else, then it's a much smaller list to create. If, however, you're going to say that I want to block it based on certain mm, traffic patterns, then a block list becomes more effective than, <clears throat> than an allow list. I'm starting to lose my voice quite quickly. OK. Um, all right. How do they analyze? So all of these software, as they become more advanced, will bring in different kinds of analysis. The oldest way is a signature analysis, which is that I know this is a recognized threat. Because I know this is a recognized threat, I am going to deal with it as a threatening object. Example. Every time a child runs near a knife, you yell at the kid. If a child picks up a knife, you yell at the child. It might not be a knife that is too dangerous, but it is definitely a knife that is dangerous. So the way the threat pattern works is that you know the knife is dangerous and so any knife is conditioned to being dangerous. You look at the knife pattern and you say it's dangerous. That's signature analysis. The second is based on behavior. Is this file, is this item doing something that we know is a dangerous activity because this has happened earlier? If yes, then we treat it as dangerous. So do you know that um, sleeping very short hours is going to give you ill health and so you prevent against that? That's a behavior analysis. You know, if you have two hours of sleep a night, the next day you are not in good shape. You cannot study, you cannot work, you cannot function. You are in a bad mood and you're snapping everybody's heads off. So you try and make sure that the two hours sleep is increased to whatever curbs your behavior patterns. The third is a pattern analysis, which is that somebody starts off with the first line of communication. Let's give you an example with one of your uh, microloan apps. <clears throat> we have thousands of microloan apps that are now finding their way onto the Play Store. Most of these apps are dangerous given the way they behave, given what they do. So you download the app, they take your permissions, and you take a loan. Now, the advantage of a microloan app is they ask, they provide you with small loans, 500 rupees, 2,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees. Those are the kinds of loans that they will provide you with. They will also provide you with the loans for a short duration of time, for 10 days, 15 days, one week, maybe a month. Let's say we've taken a loan of a thousand rupees. In we've taken it for one week. After that one week is over, we need to pay back thirteen hundred rupees. Now, if you do a calculation here, you realize that you are paying a interest of thirty percent per week. 
Now, nobody actually, you don't get a loan for 30%. Right? If you were to go to a bank and you were supposed to say, you want a loan for 10 lakhs and you're going to pay them 30% interest, uh, that bank is going to be jumping over itself to try and give you the loan because 30% interest is ridiculous. You'll typically be paying about 5 6% interest. Now, these apps, what we don't realize is not that they are charging you 30% because we look at the amount that we are paying back. We are looking at 1300 That's not so much. I mean, okay, I can pay back 1300 So that's the first part. Now you've got the loan. They've given you this interest rate. You've agreed to pay it. Uh, at the end of one week, you maybe pay the loan back. At which time they say, no, you extended by a day. So you now need to pay us another 30% more. So 300 more. You argue and you say that I paid back on time or it was hardly any delay and I refused to pay 300 rupees for this much. Now, some microloan apps will go to pretty scary extents in trying to recover your, their money, including resorting to blackmail. Now, this is a pattern that has been established over the last year and a half that microloan apps have been in existence. So when, as a security person, you see a microloan app being installed on a system, is it something you would treat as dangerous? Yes, because that is the pattern that you have seen so far. You know that this is used for dangerous purposes, and so you just assume that this is going to be dangerous based on the pattern of usage you have seen. Did my slide disappear? Let me get it back for you. Come back on. Yeah, screen sharing is back on. Sorry, I clicked escape by mistake and um, <clears throat> So the screen went off. The last of these is content. And if files contain a certain kind of content, the files are malicious. If they don't contain that content, the files are good. That is the mechanism that is used by all security devices to look for the kinds of content that exist, to look for the kinds of dangers that exist. Now, <clears throat> given that I'm totally losing my voice, I think it's safer for me to stop here. But what we do end up with is today, the way we work or the way security devices work is a combination of all of these methods of analysis. The more advanced we get, the more we learn in security, the more we realize that none of these mechanisms has a single as a single method is the best possible. These methods will only when put together are they the most uh, valuable. So let's give you an example before I stop. You're at a railway station. It's middle of the night. It's dark. It's dingy. There aren't too many people at the railway station. What you see is two people who are standing one on either side of you. <clears throat> you don't know whether your train has come or not, but you need to identify it. So you need to figure that out, but you don't want to carry all your luggage to far away, so you're going to want to talk to somebody close to you. Of these two people who are standing there, one person is uh, in torn jeans, Floaters has a rather ratty looking t shirt, long beard, uh, is um, has a not very great backpack, and is standing there looking like uh, some win of a movie. On the other side, the person who is standing there is well dressed, 
uh, clean trousers, clean shirt, shoes, socks, uh, has a nice briefcase looking bag with him. Which of these two would you go and talk to? Remember, it's middle of the night, dark, dingy, nobody else around there. Would you talk to person A, torn jeans, etc., or person B, clean, shaven, nice, well dressed person? Go on, put your responses in. No, no, you don't have a choice, Rohan. You have to talk to one of them. Most likely the well-dressed person, right? Now let's add one more parameter. What you want right now is a signature analysis. You've looked at these two characters as templates. And you've assumed that if they fit into these two patterns, then these are what the people are like. Now let's go one step further. Person B, who is your well-dressed person, is standing there and is smoking. And as you go closer, you realize the person is smelling of alcohol. Person A, who is uh, absolutely unkempt, uh, bad uh, torn jeans, slippers, that kind of stuff, is standing there eating a sandwich. Now, which person would you go to? So the people who were initially going to person B, would you still go to person B or would you now think of going to person A? Yeah, you've suddenly decided now that it's a bit of a problem. What you have done is you have switched from a signature analysis where you had a template to a behavior analysis where you're looking at the way the two of them behave and the way they are uh, standing around. Let's take it one step further. On the holiday that you were on, you have seen both these people. So you've been there for three days and these two people have also been there for three days. You have not spoken to either of them. But you have seen that when you all were at uh, common shops, uh, person A was talking to the people in a fairly normal manner, whereas person B was behaving a little badly with the shopkeepers. Every time you all went to, uh, if, if you all were at a common restaurant, the behavior pattern was repeated by the two. You also noticed that uh, person B was more likely to pick a fight with anyone who was around than person A. In this situation now, you are then more likely to talk to person A rather than person B. You've scaled further to pattern analysis. So you've gone from signature to behavior to pattern. Content in this particular situation is very difficult to identify because we know what these people are like. We've not spoken to them.
it is very likely that person B is suffering from some very major personal trauma and is acting out in this manner. They might both be absolutely safe people, absolutely nice people. They might both be extremely dangerous people. But these three patterns, these three parameters give us indications that help us deal with them. That is the kind of thing that we try and put into place in security. Okay, I am going to stop here. Do we have any questions? Okay, now it won't permit me to stop slide sharing. When you want slide sharing to happen, it doesn't. When you don't want it to happen, it uh, refuses to go off. Any anyway, questions? You can either raise your hands or you uh, can hello, type Shreta, them into the can chat box. Me? Hello, Shweta ma'am. Are you able to hear me? What have no questions at all? Okay, no questions. All right, the slides will be provided to you all, of course. Um, there was a PPT provided to you all last semester for uh, the basic levels of skill that you could put in. And you might want to use that and this together to help you out. So one of the things that is always a bit of a problem with security is that security is not constant. So I can't give you a checklist and say, if you've got one, two, three, four, five, you are absolutely secure. Uh, security is something that evolves and needs to be adapted for every individual situation. So you need to figure out what works best for you. OK, no questions at all. We will, I guess, stop here. Um, Sagar, sir? Uh, yes, uh, hello, Shweta, ma'am. I hope I'm able to, like, you're able to hear me sure now. Sagar, sir, is still on. Uh, can somebody just maybe uh, put it in the chat box if my voice is audible or not? <clears throat> Sagar, sir? I can't see him online. Okay. Let me just get in touch with him. Yes. Uh, Shweta, ma'am, um, are you not able to hear my voice?
हेलो श्वेता मैम साइली मैम प्लीज गो अहेड ओके यस सो मैम एक्चुअली सागर मैम सागर सर इज ऑन हिज वे सो दैट इज द रीजन मे बी ही वॉन्ट बी एबल टू पिक योर कॉल सो आई वुड जस्ट लाइक टू एक्सटेंड द वोट ऑफ थैंक्स फ्रॉम माई एंड टू यू सो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन टू बिगेन माई वोट ऑफ थैंक्स I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Ms. Shweta Chawla for the informative and interactive session. Uh, as usual, it has been a pleasure to attend your lecture, ma'am, and be part of your dynamic teaching style. Uh, you have always been very accommodating to all our requests over the years, and we wish for continued collaboration in the future. Uh, i would like to thank our principal for his continued support to extra credit program our extra oh. credit coordinators dr okay. khare ma'am dr desh pande ma'am for science for ms made ma'am uh, for arts i would also like to thank professor sagar thakur das for ensuring a smooth session online and my dear faculty members who have helped to make the session very successful and at the end finally thank you to our enthusiastic students for their sincere response for today's class thank you so much ma'am okay i am terribly sorry saili ma'am i couldn't hear the word uh, but you are most welcome and uh, as usual it's always a pleasure talking to you all so um, thank you and i'll share the slides with you all so you all can get those bye bye have a good day Uh thank you dear students you can leave the meeting for today thank you